Hi everyone, it's Lisa from Been There, Got Out. But we're gonna talk about um, today what it's like being pro se or self-represented in the legal system. There you are. Yes, and yes, you said my name perfectly. Good, I remember like Michelle, Liel, I just wanna make sure. Okay, so, um, so I actually found you because I was doing an article about what it's like being pro se, because I think I told you I've been pro se for years on and off. Um, mostly on <laughs> to save money. And I saw something about you and thought this is this would be a perfect person to talk to because so many people in our community have had to go pro se. Um, you know, a lot of them are victims of legal abuse and being dragged through the system, mostly in terms of family court um, with post separation abuse during a divorce that takes years, drains thousands and hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars. And so, you know, people run out of money and they think, I don't have a choice. I either give in or I go pro se. So um, I thought before you even really get into your story, I know that you had said in our first conversation that the people, that people tend to use the, the justice system to be crooks. And we talked about the prevalence of fraud and lies until you go to, to trial. And I was thinking about how so many people in our community are always, um, dealing with false accusations in court. And so, um, you know, especially when it comes to custody battles. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. And I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, but um, just to be kind of concise with it, first of all, I'm in a civil dispute, so it has to do with a business dispute. But I'm definitely, even in business disputes, gaslighting occurs, you know, beyond belief. Um, so I have been dealing with a lot of crooked um, attorneys and crooked opposition that um, just rely on their own lies because they have a lot of experience and they know that it doesn't matter um, because no one's doing anything about lies. Um, it's too expensive to. The truth is becoming very expensive. So um, That's a great quote. <laughs> reason why I'm saying that people are using our misusing our judicial system it's because they're kind of behind it to do what they want to do which is cheat people one way or another um, because it's a slow sleepy judicial system and they're not really keeping up or catching up with that yet um, and there's not much they can do about it either unless you're moving the court to do things and there's limited things that you can do and that they can do at certain stages um, even if it means like terminating certain rights and things like that that are extreme, you know, you have to, you know, show some pretty deliberate stuff that is probably going to have to go to trial um, to even get to that level where it matters to them. And then the truth does matter. The thing to not forget about truth is that it does not fall apart. Lies do. They may not do. They may not fall apart at first and they may not fall apart for years, but they eventually fall apart. So it's, um, you know, learning how to handle and, and allow the opposition to lie, which is kind of what I had to do, um, is, is probably the strongest position to take. And I have learned a lot of different things in that process that have empowered me and made me more and more successful in moving the court in the directions that are favorable to the outcomes that I need to put this behind me and, you know, get on with, <laughs> you know, other experiences in life. So... Yeah, and I'm so glad you say you said that about the lying and how, you know, in the beginning everybody lies and that, that I wrote down the quote that you said, allow allow the opposition to lie because the truth doesn't fall apart. And I know in my own experience it is it's taken years, but it is it is coming out and it's staying true. It's just a matter of like enforcing what comes with the truth. So I'm really excited. I can't wait to hear like all the things that you've learned or uh, even a bunch of the th things that you've learned along the way. So tell us a little bit about your story and why you, you yourself decided to go pro se. Okay, so um, I kind of, I was buying a, a German restaurant for my nonprofit. We spent like a quarter of a million dollars on it and we ended up getting entangled in some people that didn't want to give us what we paid for. Um, I ended up uh, kind of trying in good faith to operate the restaurant for a year unpaid as their manager while I tried to get them to transfer it to me and they wouldn't. They ended up taking it back, keeping my money and suing me for fraud. And wow. the thing about it is um, I, you know, found out a little too late that they had a ton of litigation experience and a ton of different disputes professionally for a long time and very, very high level 
So they'd already been through litigation so much and gotten away with so much that they had so much confidence that they could do the same thing. And it's the, you know, most likely I'm going to walk away or settle, you know, and that's kind of how they looked at me. I had, um, because we were a, a nonprofit president, um, and I'm not going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars um, on lawyers to litigate people and fight people. I had a very kind hearted attorney that was reasonable. And the thing is, he he knew these guys were bad actors. He was totally committed, you know, to doing what he could do. But they were very, very aggressive and very aggressive from the beginning, you know, motions to disqualify, motions for restraining orders, everything they, they could do. And there, be, there came a point pretty early on, I didn't have a case at issue yet. They only had their case at issue against me, um, again, for fraud, because apparently I gave them a quarter of a million dollars, didn't get the restaurant, and I'm the crook. But what, <laughs> whatever was that. Um, Typical. I don't know crooks that do that, but maybe they are, they're out there. Um, so I'm at home, you know, working on getting my evidence together for my attorneys. I'm going back and forth with them. We're trying to put together RICO fraud claims at that point. This is years ago. And um, I noticed that they're hacking my email. They're literally go in my email box, my personal email, and forwarding emails to themselves from me and my attorney and my accountant and different things. And I panicked. And I called the police. And I met the police at the restaurant to stop it. And they turned around and filed a restraining order against me. And it's <laughs> at that point that I said, I have to take this in my own hands. There's, you know, my attorneys, kind hearted attorneys don't know how to keep up with this. They couldn't do it for me. And no one's going to care that much except me. And no one's going to take it as seriously as I need to take it, not only for my nonprofit that's been cheated, but I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I let this happen, not just to me or my nonprofit, but to anybody. So it was frightening, I will not lie. And my attorney back then actually was the person that recommended it, which I felt good about because he was going to be supportive and try to help me as much as he could. It's funny because now years later, I'm helping him with cases, his cases, but <laughs> so, we have a Is it, so wait, your attorney recommended that you go pro se. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's interesting because my divorce attorney also after the divorce said, Lisa, you should go pro se because if you continue to have me on your case, he's going to con continue bleeding you financially. So do what you can yourself. So you got that same advice. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I guess lawyers give that advice uh, commonly. So, um, well, it's really hard. Any case is so hard, even for a lawyer. I mean, they're not, you know, no, and, and lawyers don't get paid to think and strategize. They get paid to just file things for you. What do you want? Okay, let me just file it. They're not thinking that hard, and they're not thinking of long term. They're just thinking mm -hmm. short term, you know, bill you, get it done, get it filed, and go drive their Porsche or whatever it is that they do. So it's, they're not, you know, in it. I mean, there are some attorneys that care and that are great, but most people can't afford them. So. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we, you know, the other thing I'm thinking about is similar to your situation, even though yours was a different, you know, yours was more civil, but um, just, just today we had a call earlier from a client who's really worried, and this is such a common scenario where she said, the other side has unlimited financial resources. The family is financing this whole, you know, years and years of, of legal abuse against me to get me to give in. Like, how can I even have a shot of going up against all that money? So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's tough. Um, I think, I mean, what is the goal for them? Are they, I mean, when it's fighting for your children, you can't stop and you have right. to realize that, you know, your kids are going to know you fought for them and that in and of itself is important, you know, for that relationship that you have. Um, but those things get really, really rough and you just got to keep moving along. Eventually, you know, I mean, I kind of look at, at, whatever people try to scare the other party with is most likely what they're most scared of. And mm. it's cool when you're dealing with attorneys that have their own fears, um, it could be professional responsibility issues eventually um, because they do get afraid they could lose their license if they're 
you know, not following through and you might want to do some research on what, what, professional responsibilities they have that they might be breaching that you might be able to report them on if they're doing things that are just, you know, against those <laughs> responsibilities um, and just in furtherance of their client, but that are not proper, um, you know, and, and, and try to find what is it if, if, if the, their opposition, the client has a different fear, mostly he's, if it is, you know, to just get you to spend so much money, his fear might be just to waste money, to, to lose money too. So mm -hmm. I would just start to think about that. There's no like flat answer that I would ever have for somebody because everyone's situation is so unique and, you know, important for them what is right for them. But I definitely think just, you know, there are some things you can do to be in it for the long run and to start to have the more stability you have in what you're doing, the more those the opposition starts to say, okay, I don't like this anymore. They're not, right. they're not as weak as I thought they were. They're not as vulnerable to the games I was able to play at the beginning. They're actually putting a case together. They're actually like, like, for instance, one thing I did that was really important for me, I don't know, can I explain this? Yeah, of course. Um, because I was dealing with so many inconsistent statements and so many lies, I decided, um, like, and I was trying to organize those in my mind. And what do I do with them? If the court doesn't care, what do I do to be more organized and prepared for anything I have to do? Motions to trial, whatever it is. And I started to make a timeline of the lies, the inconsistent statements, and actually record where did they make that, under oath, in what declaration, page number, paragraph number, what did they say? Then what happened on this date? What did they say? How is that inconsistent? And I'd make like, you know, thousand page documents in Adobe, you know, with the supporting documents and the timeline at the front of it. And it started to make me feel more confident in terms of what I had to work with when I needed to work with certain things to communicate, because it's all about communication. And a pro per can do that. You know, it's not lawyers aren't the best communicators in the world. They do have a lot of structure and education and refining, but a pro per can learn that stuff too. And they're going to it's going to be more important to them what they're communicating than any lawyer or paralegal. Exactly. Cause we only have one case. It's ours. It's our life. And it matters more to us, to them. They have several and they don't care as much, like you said. So that's one thing that, um, that I did. And then, and then there's, there's subtle little things you can do that start to um, create a different atmosphere between the opposition. If you're intimidated by them, cause I definitely was, um, and like it got to the point, and I'll t I tell this one story, um, or, or I was thinking of it today for per particularly for this, because it was a, a moment where things changed for me. I was on the phone with the opposing counsel in a meet and confer, and he really riled me up because, of course, I'm vulnerable. These are hot issues. And, um, and at one point, he said that I needed to take my medication or something like oh. that. And of course, I get off the phone and I'm like, what happened there? How did I fall for this? What is going on? And how do I conquer this? Like, how can I let this person say things to me like this and me respond to it? I don't want to be that weak to those kinds of things. So what I realized is that's a tactic in and of itself from an uh, opposing counsel, where they'll take the attention off the issues and the fact when they're not in their favor the law, the facts, the issues that you're really disputing and litigating or, you know, or fighting for. Um, and they make it personal. And anytime they do that, it's, it's showing their big weakness, really, because otherwise they'd focus on the issues and the facts. So mm -hmm. I started to say, you know what, I, next time I'm going to be more prepared. And when he does that, I'm just going to make it obvious. Like, I know you might want to make this personal and about me, but it's really about the issues. Can we get back to the issues now? We really need to focus on the issues. What's the issue here? And the more I was, you know, learned how to, you know, recognize what issue are you actually dealing with at different times, the more I was in control, the more he looked more um, immature. And the more I just called it out and the less and less he was capable of doing that because it didn't work and it just made him look like a fool. So there are certain things that you can do in the process that are going to be long term, empowering, and kind of turn the tables as much as you can 
even if they have a lot of money. So. Yeah, I mean, I love that you mentioned that about them using getting personal with you and with all of us to distract from the real issues because they don't have the facts, they don't have the law, and they don't have the truth on their side. And it is, once we see it as a strategy, we can distance a little bit. And I know one of, a friend of ours who's an attorney has told us that he, he felt like it was very easy to win against most pro se, I keep saying pro se and you say pro per, but it's basically self-represented litigants because we, it is our life and we do tend to get so emotional so once they get under their, our skin, they, they win because we get distracted. So that's so important, again, to remember. And this is what we talked about in an Instagram Live with him and another woman last week, Angie, um, that everyone else generally is looking at it as a business transaction. So we also have to pay attention to the issue. What's the goal? I got to get this money taken care of. I got to figure out the custody situation with the kids. And to put the emotions aside and realize, again, just like, like you said, labeling what it is, knowing what it is and being like, I'm not going to fall for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I, as you were talking, I was thinking, I noticed that in my own case, one of my ex's attorneys, um, I won't get into details, but let's say is, is like a blowhard, I call him, and he likes to shout a lot. And some of the judges have let him get away with that. And so what I tried once was say, can we just, and he was also friendly with the judge. So I just said, can, can we go back to the orders though? Like, can we please just pause on that and let's just look at what's here and that got him to shut up and the judge finally paid attention and I, that's when I really made significant progress during that hearing so that is excellent excellent advice okay um and I'm glad too that you said the thing about the money what I was thinking is that you know it's the same thing with me like my ex has tons and tons of money that he's been spending on lawyers for years while I've been pro se but I find that, um, like you said, they, they run out of, you know, they run out of energy because they think they're going to win and that we won't be intimidated. Um, but that just because they have a lot of money to pay attorneys, the point you made about attorneys aren't as good in, as some of us as pro se who are organized and not emotional. So they get, I find that they've been very sloppy with things. Like, I feel like I have to work so much harder because it is my case. I'll proofread things many, many times to make sure it's right. And I think judges sometimes are more impressed by somebody self-representing who's doing a decent job, yep. you know? So it does intimidate them and, and they hate losing to, to self-represented litigants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the system. You said there's like, it's, it's a ripoff, there's cheating, settlement issues, and courts not having the time. Do you want to say more about that? Um, okay, so I don't know if I ever used a ripoff, but um, the system, meaning just our judicial system. Yeah. I think our judicial system is great. I don't think it's being used for what it needs to be used for, but I think we always just need to work harder to make it be used for what it needs to be used for, which is for justice and for the truth and for things to get in the right perspective and for issues to be disputes to be resolved properly. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I've gone through a little bit of an evolution because I misunderstood what the courts like how it worked, obviously, it's stepping into it, you think that judges are there for that and they're not, they're just like referees. Um, one big game changing moment for me in the process of representing myself was understanding that you have to move the court. I mean, it sounds like a basic thing and you guys probably all have understood that now, but until you understand that, you don't know. And moving the court is not a simple thing to do in and of itself. I remember I filed like, in the beginning before my case was at issue again, I had filed I did a lot of discovery and I had six motions to compel because they didn't, um, you know, they just objected to everything. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to motion to compel. I had a lawyer that was coaching me and helped give me templates for the motions. And I followed the templates and he approved them and I filed them and they all got denied. Oh. I was at that point. Um, and I remember even like I got to do some oral arguments and I came all prepared and I had an argument for every little interrogatory and why I needed, you know, to compel those things. And the judge was really gracious and listened to me, which, by the way, I learned is a professional responsibility of the judge. They don't really care, but they are listening because they have to to pro se's. Um, but he basically denied everything. And I went home that day thinking, OK, there's a lot of prejudice, um, but instead of thinking about that, instead I'm gonna turn it around and think, okay, I'm not communicating enough 
good enough. I need to do better because there, I know, I believe in myself and my experience enough to know that what I'm trying to discover, what I'm trying to prove, how these people have cheated me is my truth. So I'm going to figure it out. And, and, and that's when I um, started to uh, turn the corner and, and start to draft my own motions, not from templates because I found that they work. I'm getting off your original question, but can you remind me? That's okay, keep question? going. This is really important, go ahead. Okay, so I just um, remember saying that instead of like feeling sorry for myself or blaming the system, which is I think the question that you asked, instead of blaming the system, I'm gonna just find a better and better way to communicate what it is so that they can hear me. And the next motions to compel I did, I did get granted all of them and they made a huge difference in my case, huge difference. So they were very important and I did get sanctions in one against the opposing counsel. Wow, and, that's hard. And yeah, and, and those were motions that I feel like were phenomenal motions. I mean, I'd, I'd hang them on my wall. They were so <laughs> good, but I, I know the feeling, I know. I know, I'm so glad, let me just have you pause for one second, but I'm so glad that you noted that even though you got denied, like the things that you wanted in the beginning, you recognized it's not the end. Like, I'm not going to give up and walk away and be disappointed. I'm going to figure out how I have to keep coming back. And that's what we train our clients within our legal abuse support group, as well as our individual clients. It's like, it's not the end just because you don't get the decision you want when you want it. You know, it's just like what you said, you have to figure out how to keep coming back and making your case stronger. So keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's just, uh, that's I think the story <laughs> for that. Mm -hmm. So our judicial system, um, though there's some flaws and it's all people and, and, and you never know, I think what it comes down to, oh, I know, I know what I wanna say about this. Um, okay, hold on, let me just think for one second. Sorry. Um, that's okay. You know what's gonna happen? I'll ask you another question, then you go, oh yeah, oh yeah, because that's what I do yeah, too. Yeah, go ahead and do that because it's not okay. my time. All right, so, so I think you, you already answered like what changed the game for you earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about, and you said you, you did notice a bit of bias and prejudice against, against being self-represented. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit? And of course, if you remember the other thing, then just jump in with that. Yeah, I think it's like borderline on that. Um, I just think that, okay. Now I do get it. Okay, so in the process of realizing that um, there's gonna be some prejudice and focusing on that is just gonna keep me weak and really when I need to focus on is how am I communicating, what am I saying? It also opened me up to understand that the opposing counsel and the other, par the other parties, they're just focusing on what they're saying. And they're a good reflection of what that is because I'm sure you could read their motions going, do they even know what I'm saying? Are and responding to what I'm saying are they do they even care and no they don't because they have learned to focus on what it is they're saying so when I started to instead of sh you know having the feeling sorry for myself I'm never gonna like make it they're always gonna have some prejudice against me or they're gonna just think I don't know what I'm talking about instead I started to say I'm gonna focus on what it is that I'm saying and I'm gonna not care I'm gonna make notes on what they're saying I'm gonna argue what their authorities are or what it is that they're trying to make it issue whether it is or isn't, but I'm gonna really focus on what is my story. And once I started to sink into that and realize that I'm not gonna be distracted by what it is that they're trying to put out there, mine became stronger and more complete and more powerful and more effective and, you know, and, and reached the judge and the judge heard it and could see it and things started to turn around at that point too. So I think that's important when we're navigating our judicial system as many deficits as it has, um, you know, to just keep trying to make what you're communicating stronger, better, more clear, more in harmony with the law and more in harmony with how they need to hear it and not so much about how you need to say it or how you need to um, make sure the opposition hears it because who cares? They're not listening to it anyway. They don't care. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting because it, it is really staying focused on the narrative of what matters for your case. And I know we, we interviewed an attorney a couple of weeks ago who was saying, realistically, you often only have just a few minutes to, to say your case. So you need to make sure it's really tight. And so we'll often say to our clients, think of it like you have a, you're making a commercial. 
-hmm. you know, you have to make sure and they, you know, judges and everyone else, they're human. So think about what, you know, what will affect them. What's your most powerful piece of evidence at the beginning, another powerful piece at the end. What can you say in between? What documents do you have that support it, but not getting too emotional about it, but, you know, staying just fo focused on what, you know, your, your story and presenting that and letting them do whatever they do. Right. Because again, it comes down to the facts and the truth. Yep. And the issue, I think it's, it's always good. And that's one thing they do learn in law school and people learn in, in law school. And as lawyers, you always want to know what is the issue and start to be really good at because at every stage, there's a different issue and the judge knows and you need to start to connect with the judge of what does he think the issue is? Because if mm. you focus on the issue and always start with the issue is whether this or this means that and that or whatever it is and then you go and you bring your evidence and you bring your um, support or your authorities to that issue and then conclude with what it is that you want you'll be way more effective um, especially in terms of communicating with the judge and in the motions um, if you're always thinking in that kind of formula which is something that you learn in in law school. So it's one reason why they might have a, an upper hand, even though they shouldn't based on it, because it probably sounds all over the place or, or when they're trying to distract from the issue, which most crooked lawyers try to do, they're, they're not really, they, they will make up an issue that isn't an issue. Um, but if you know what the issue is, really, is really you're going to be in a better position to communicate with the judge. So, and get yeah. It. Yeah, really smart. Okay, so before you started mentioning about how you learned to communicate better, so I thought I, I should ask you about what, what are some ways that you, that you find people can con communicate more strategically, um, you know, both in motions and in court? Like, how can someone be more persuasive? That's a big question. And I think <laughs> I something like, you know, um, there's a lot to that. Um, some people are better at writing. Some people are better at oral situations. I think that it does start with dissecting what is really at issue um, and learning a little bit about that so that you can focus your arguments. Um, but then, you know, for me, I feel like I have to make it sound as beautiful as a song. Like if it doesn't sound like a song to me that I want to hear over and over again, I'm rewriting it and I'm rewriting it until it sounds like music to me that someone's going to want to read that first paragraph and read more. And if there's anything in there that takes them out of that mood to do that, I get rid of it. Um, and I, and I try to use evidence, authorities, facts, you know, things that aren't going to create any sort of weakness in the argument or what it is that I'm trying to persuade or have the judge see um, for my case to move along. Um, that's how I do it. But, um, you know, most people don't have that kind of time or you know, to do that. So it's, it's very individual. And it can be much more simple. And the simpler you can make it, the better. So that's why it always starts out with what is the issue? What is the authority then? What are your facts? What is your evidence? And what are you asking for? Because mm -hmm. of it. So, I mean, the more and more you can get into that, you know, obviously, and, and get rid of anything that distracts from that. Any digs, any emotional pain, you know, from what it is that's going on. Um, you know, the more effective it'll be for a judge who doesn't, who isn't looking at it from an emotional perspective. He's trained not to, which is why so many people with emotional problems can retain their rights, you know? Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. But I mean, so my, my, I, my background is as a, a high school English teacher and I'm a professional writer. And like you said, I feel like the writing skills that you bring to the table or have someone else help you with can make such a difference in how you communicate, you know? And I always like to slice away lots of stuff unless it really, really matters. So that's important to be able to do that and to read something over and over, have somebody else read it, neutral person, not just your friend who's gonna say it's wonderful. It's so good to just understand that there's always a better way to communicate. It can always be better. The more you're open to that, the more you're gonna be open to more inspiration because every sentence is like a mood. And you want to think about that, what kind of mood the judge needs or his, you know, uh, secretary, whoever's reading it, um, to want to stay with it, especially mm -hmm. with 
all the moving papers they have on their desk. You want to like if 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 the mood has an edge to it or it just seems to, like to have a little bit of distrust because it's kind of, you know, whatever disharmony a sentence has, you want to start to be sensitive to those things and think what would you want to read from somebody? Mm -hmm. And um and if you don't want to read that or if you feel like that doesn't have a place there, there's other ways to say it just as powerfully and just as uh, you know, as impactfully without something that's going to make them kind of turn away in the, inside themselves. There are yeah. a lot to connect through. Yeah. And uh, orally that uh, can be learned, but it needs to be like played with and practiced individually. Yeah, I was going to say practice, a lot of practice. Yeah. Role playing is always a good thing that we, we like to do too with our clients. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, you talked a little bit about opposing counsel, like the things you learned. I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanted to add about what you learned in the process about opposing counsel. Well, they became um, less and less intimidating and I became more intimidating to them as things moved on. I think just because of just sticking with it and not giving up. And I think those things do affect them. They're not, you know, the most secure people in the world. <laughs> they have insecurities. Um, you know, again, I think you brought up a good point. They don't like to be, um, you know, uh, against pro se's that then do get somewhere with the motions and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so I just think that things can change with opposing counsel. You can gain respect even though they'll never tell you that. Oh, and tell like, me about it. Um, <laughs> you'll feel it. You'll feel the difference. I remember one day I got an email back. It was always, um, my case was always Burling, which was their client, versus Arad, which is me. And one day he sends me an email and it says Arad versus Burling. And I said, oh. I know the game has changed. He knows it's me against them. It's not them against me anymore. You know, like it was a mistake, but it was a one of those funny kind of mistakes that I like, I can feel that, that I do have their respect and they're just doing their job. So, you know. Yeah. Haven't you found it's like, I feel like some of my life's greatest triumphs have been after certain times in court when I know I did really well. And then I, fi I find out I won what I needed to get. I just feel like so good. And especially because I know that I, that I did it myself. And the thing you talked about with opposing counsel being disrespectful, like my, one of the attorneys that my ex has um, for years has been saying, well, you know, Lisa, you don't really know because you're not an attorney, like all the time. But in the process, she's lost basically every single motion. It's been like a steady you know, against me all the way up to the appellate court where now it's in Connecticut Law Journal, her name's in there for being, you know, submitting stuff that has no basis in law or fact against a pro se. And I'm just like, <laughs> who's the lawyer? I'm not the lawyer, but. <laughs> yeah, no, that does. And I remember <laughs> how hard it is to do any motion. I've done things that have taken me a month to draft, like my motions for summary judgment and things like that, that take so much time. And there's so much of you that wants to make an excuse for not doing it. You just want to say, well, do I have to do that? Oh, yes. Yeah do this can't I just figure something out or settle with them this way or that way and every time I just said okay no I, I have to think more long term how am I going to feel when I'm done with this if I, I need to keep doing this for me you know and then I do it and I feel so free so good like what you're saying and so it is empowering it can empowering it can take you to another level whatever it is that you're working on with or fighting for your children which is the most gut-wrenching type of process to go through um or you're fighting for money or you know or people not having you know dominating you or whatever it is um it does it is empowering to learn these things and to be able to do it ourselves and then not be afraid of it you know forever you know yeah i mean again like with that feeling of triumph i feel like i've got i have felt the most triumphant when i've done something that i'm really scared to do I did it and then I actually like succeeded. You just feel like so much better because you really challenged yourself and you, you win, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, so now how about you talk about what you're doing? You, you decided to go to law school. Yes. 
Um, it was wonderful. And I did um, in the process, which was kind of unique. I ended up um, taking the baby bar out here in California and I, I passed the baby bar and I, they have what to yeah, say what the baby bar is. Cause some people didn't, don't know what a baby bar is. I, I was mentioning it to my partner. He's like, I picture a bunch of babies drinking beer. Well, Kim Kardashian <laughs> made it famous. I don't know if you oh. know four times she did pass. Um, it's for people that um, didn't have like a bachelor's degree or going through um, becoming a lawyer um, through an apprenticeship as opposed to school. Um, so the baby bar is really hard. They say it's harder than the regular bar. I don't believe that, but it is for a one year loss because you have to do, it's still a full day of four essays and 200 MBs. It's really, 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 really difficult to do. Um, uh, but it's not the bar. The bar is two days and there's 13 subjects. This is three. So um, it's not as complicated. But when I passed it, they have what's called a practical training for students where you can practice law um, under certain um, supervisions. I my friend Lily, who worked at the restaurant with me, she was a bartender, and she was a young student that just passed the bar. So she didn't have any professional experience yet. But um, but uh, she's she and I have been working together. And so I'm technically under her supervision, representing my corporation as a lawyer under her, and then representing myself as a pro se um, separately. So it's a little unique and I'm headed towards trial in like a month. It's been delayed <laughs> for a couple of um, but it's in March and um, we have like six expert witnesses, 20 witnesses, oh. um, thousand documents of evidence, lots of impeachment material. Um, just amazing. Like for me, it's like that last stage where, okay, now you've made a case that like you said, is based in no law. There's no authority to it. This whole, I gave you a quarter million dollars the money and the restaurant and sued me for fraud like there's no real basis for it but go ahead and let make your case now and then i'm making mine which i put together and they've they haven't really been putting together like i have so it's going to be interesting to say the least and we'll see what what happens with this and i don't give up so if i have to appeal i have to appeal but i, I don't think i'll have to i i think i i have a lot of confidence in what i put together my experts are top shelf you know, I did spend a lot of money on that <laughs> expert. <laughs> all another game. Um, and, uh, you know, I have all my evidence and we've done our e exhibit list and everything. So what's authenticated, what's, um, you know, admissible at this point. And they are throwing out like 17 motions in Lemonade to exclude evidence. But, you know, yeah, there's all kinds of fun stuff still in this last part of this situation. But, um when I'm done with that, um, I'm putting together more stuff to help pro se's because I'm definitely passionate about that. I think that's the future anyway. I think pro se's and people that have legal issues have to get involved, even if they have a lawyer. If they really want to get somewhere, they need to be involved. And I think that having more and more understanding and what they can do and be more empowered in that process and less afraid of it or intimidated by it or feeling like it's not really like they're not accepted in it, I think is important. So I'm, you know, intending to kind of tell my story. Um, hopefully it's an inspiring one. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, and then, you know, do something to help others. And then, you know, we'll see. I'm sure my life will change a little bit. This has been a four year process for me. So I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how can people I know you're bit you're going to be busy with th this whole trial thing for at least a month. But mm -hmm. what should people know, like if somebody wants advice on being pro se, do you have any workshops? Is there anything yeah. that you offer? And how can people find you? I am doing a workshop Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. on Zoom. And I'm trying to make them workshops where we just literally work on what you need to work on. So you have discovery because everything takes so much attention. How to ask a great question that's not just going to get objections or, you know, how to object, you know, any little specific thing I want to have like a where we work on those things and then kind of hold people's hands, um, you know, in when, when they're drafting motions or things like that. So I am doing that. They can follow me on TikTok or Instagram, which I have no posts yet, but I am just starting to kind of um, be involved in those things and I'm going to be more and more involved in those things and okay um, say I, your say your handle on Instagram and on TikTok so on TikTok it's self-represented litigant and on Instagram it's lawsuits me 
So yeah, I was like, law suits me, law suits me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a great name. Love, love that name. Um, and then um, I do have a website and stuff like that, but it's a name that would be too difficult to uh, put. But try to connect with me on one of those things and let me know you're interested in resources or things like that and uh, and take it from there. So. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Liel, for this. This really has been inspiring. I mean, I learned a couple things as well, and I feel better knowing I'm going back into trial <laughs> for three days in March myself, and I'm just like, okay. You can I got some tips. <laughs> so thanks, thanks again, and we'll catch up with you soon. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, bye.